Hello, Health 230 students. This is Brian Clark. Today I will be going over chapter number 15, Life Cycle Nutrition, Infancy, Childhood, and Adolescence. This is lecture one of two. We will begin by talking about nutrition during infancy. And before I review this information, I do want to point out that there is some information in the highlight section at the end of chapter number 15 that I find to be very clinically relevant and um, probably a little bit more specific than some of the relatively general information that we will will be discussing in chapter number 15 so it is my recommendation that you read the information at the end of chapter number 15 and focus some of your efforts there on that highlight material because I think that you'll find that the information in that highlight section will be very relevant um, in, a, in a work atmosphere Okay, uh, let's dig into the information in chapter number 15. In particular, we will start out with talking about nutrition during infancy, and there's no time that is more important to an individual's life. Uh, body weight is going to approximately triple during the first year of life, and as you can well imagine, during that time frame when growth is very rapid, uh, we, we absolutely must have the building blocks that are necessary for tissue to form. That is especially true as it relates to, to bones and um, and neural tissue. So if in the event that, say for example, an adequate amount of vitamin D is not present, you're going to see, uh, see there being issues with bone density, uh, maybe even osteoporosis later in life. Uh, if in the event that um, adequate amounts of, of um, uh, vitamin B12 are not available, uh, you may very well see cognitive decrements. So uh, it, it's important that that an infant be getting adequate dietary intake during that time frame because if an infant is not getting adequate intake there will be consequences later in life. Now luckily uh, it's fairly easy to make sure that an infant is getting adequate intake and it really is as easy as making sure that an infant is either breastfeeding or eating or I guess I should say drinking formula uh, that should be a major portion of an infant's diet um, and I guess I better be careful about how I say infant a lot of people consider an infant to be five months or less and um, and really during that five months or less period uh, we're gonna want that uh, want that child to be ingesting either breast milk or formula exclusively. There's really no need for anything else on a dietary level. Uh, moving on to energy intake and activity, that just that's a bullet point mentioning what I said a moment ago that um, by year one we're going to see weight approximately triple. Uh, I'm going to talk about energy nutrients here more in just a moment, so I'm, I'm going to skip over that. <clears throat> uh, it's worth noting that uh, as it relates to vitamins and minerals that there is more than a double the need of an adult proportionally to weight for infants. Uh, in particular, vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin D, and iodine are especially needed during that first year. Uh, also, it is important that an infant get an adequate amount of, uh, of water. Um, and, and really what's probably more important to, to note is that when an infant, um, and, I, and I'm going to expand that out to really uh, about during the first year. If a baby during the first year has gastrointestinal distress, whether that be diarrhea or vomiting, that that is a, a major reason for concern and uh, one that may very well need um, need some type of medical intervention. Uh, it doesn't take very long for an infant to become significantly dehydrated and there can be major consequences, even uh, death, 
if in the event that a, an infant is dehydrated. So um, please realize how easy it is for an infant to get dehydrated and be very conscious and aware of that. Moving on to figure 15-2. I'm only going to point out a couple of these. Um, and do me a favor, now would be a good time to hit pause, look over figure 15-2. And um, the ones I really want you to take a look at are vitamin A, vitamin D, and iodine. And what you're going to notice in particular about vitamin D and iodine is that there is an enormous need during that first year of life and comparatively to uh, the remainder um, of our life, or in, in this case, uh, compared to a 20-year-old male. And uh, uh, breast milk, in particular, does not have an adequate amount of vitamin D that is needed for, for bone development. Um, infants that do not get an adequate amount of vitamin D oftentimes suffer from osteopenia or osteoporosis later in life. Um, so e even if an infant is breastfeeding, uh, it still does need a supplement, uh, a supplement that is high in vitamin D and iodine. Uh, couple items from this slide. Uh, it's worth knowing that lactose is the form of carbohydrate in breast milk and that allows for more proficient calcium absorption. Uh, also, you may want to commit to memory that um, alpha lactalbumin is the form of protein in milk and that allows for uh, milk to be more easily digested and absorbed. Uh, it's also important that uh, that an infant is getting very generous amounts of essential fatty acids. You know, we we oftentimes think of those fatty acids as being uh, be, being negative or being adverse to health, in particular the fatty acid, uh, the uh, saturated fatty acids. But that's not necessarily the case. Actually, that's very much not the case. Uh, for infants. Infants need those essential fatty acids for neural development and also uh, to allow uh, things like vitamin A, you know, really all your fat soluble vitamins, to be moved very easily through the blood. Um, without, fat, sorry, without fat soluble vitamins, your um, I'm sorry, I said that backwards. Uh, without without those fatty acids, uh, then your your fat soluble vitamins will not be circulated throughout the body. Uh, that's slightly irrelevant in my opinion. We'll keep on moving. Um, I'll mention here um, the information about the calcium. Yes, calcium that you find in breast milk is very well absorbed. Um, however, there's just not enough of it. <laughs> um, so I don't want you to think that's contradicting anything that I've said earlier. Um, y yes, there is a certain amount of calcium in breast milk. It's just not an appropriate, it's not an adequate amount. Uh, also, there's a very high bioavailability of iron and zinc. Um, very, breast milk is very low in sodium and, and fluoride. And, um, and that's the, the first of which there is, is a good thing. Um, vitamin D I've already talked about. Uh, so we'll change gears here a little bit, talk about one of the risks or a couple of the risks uh, for formula feeding a baby. Uh, obviously, if you are formula feeding a baby, you need water for the formula, and there's always that possibility of, of, of there being contaminants, in particular lead in the water. Uh, that can cause some major cognitive delays, if not um, you know, lifetime decrements. Also, formula contains no antibodies, and um, uh, doing just a real quick review here. Uh, when a 
when an when an individual is exposed to a pathogen, regardless of what that pathogen is, whether it be bacterial, bacterial, viral, fungal, uh, our body, in particular our white blood cells, produce antibodies against that pathogen. So if in the event that uh, a mother has antibodies against certain pathogens circulating in her blood, uh, she is going to pass those on to the infant via her milk. And that is going to provide the infant some immunity against those same pathogens. Um, so if the infant is, is eating formula exclusively, well, then that, uh, that um, heightened level of immunity does not exist. Uh, this is worth pointing out. You'll notice that there is a little difference between the fat, protein, carbohydrate concentration of infant formula versus breast milk. Um, infant formula has a little bit more protein, uh, a little bit less fat. Um, carbohydrate uh, levels are, are very similar. Um, and uh, that's what um, what research has shown us to be most appropriate. Uh, that, that's I've always found that fascinating because um, you know, you've got to ask yourself, you know, what, what's you know, what, what better research is there out there other than um, than, than evolution? And um, but it, but nonetheless, uh, for whatever reason, we see uh, there being a little bit different. Um, different levels of protein, fat, and carbohydrate. I'm sure that would be a, a wonderful thesis project for, for a master's student. All right, continuing on with nutrition during infancy. Um, talk a little bit about infant formula standards. The AAP, or American Academy of Physicians, they have guidelines for for formula or what should be in formula and the Food and Drug Administration also mandates safety and nutritional qualities and um, by far and large if you are buying formula at, at a fairly well-known grocery store regardless of whether it's 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 a Walmart or Food Lion or Kroger uh, you really don't have to worry too much um, the formulas that you will buy there they're going to meet the AAP guidelines as well as um, you know, they've, they've, the FDA is regulating what is being sold. However, um, sometimes in these little specialty nature shops, uh, there are are formulas sold there as well, and there are some pretty significant risks that go along with those because sometimes those are not FDA regulated and. Um, just a few years ago, I think it was 2007, 2008, uh, there there were a there there was a significant amount of formula being sold, kind of on these little black markets. Um, it had been made in China. Um, it had some um, some impurities in it that was that was causing babies to get sick. Uh, so um, I, I will make the kind of broad general recommendation that um, that you always use that you always buy formula from a fairly well-known source or a fairly well-known um, that you buy a fairly well-known name brand uh, one item here that's worth noting um, goat's milk is not a good alternative for formula um, now let's ch change gears a little bit and talk about nursing and tooth decay. And um, yes, uh, certainly nursing can contribute to a, a, a small extent to tooth decay. But um, so so long as a uh, or I guess I should say when a child uh, starts getting teeth. A parent needs to be cleaning those teeth, but additionally, some things that can, that a parent can do to help minimize tooth decay is to lay, lay off the juice, especially the really high sugar juices. Um, you know, just uh, juices can very easily be watered down, um, allowing a, a baby to go to go to sleep with a juice bottle uh, always inappropriate, and that is most definitely going to contribute to to tooth decay. Uh, right there, you see 
a picture of some pretty major tooth decay. That is figure 15-5. And uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to need to stop here, and we'll pick back up with two of two.